Hi, all. Uh, we're just going to get started with uh, our presentation today. Uh, so Ahmad and I are here. We're going to talk about um, video decoding uh, and video data loading. So Ahmad and I are part of PyTorch at Meta. Uh, we are part of these uh, part of the Torch data team um, as well as the Torch Kodak team. So those are both. Uh, those are both repos that you can go and check out, and we'll be talking a little bit about them today. Uh, we're obviously part of a much larger team. There's a, a lot of folks who went into the making of, of what we're going to discuss today. So the example we're going to go through, uh, we were able to improve the end-to-end -end training throughput for video data loading on a bit of a toy example, but still pretty relevant. Um, and uh, we were able to improve it by about 20x. Uh, so we work internally with teams at Meta as well as with uh, folks in open source and help to improve end-to-end -end training, uh, video data loading, or decoding, and pre-proc. Um, we're going to be discussing a bunch of different techniques today. Hopefully some of these are useful to you. Some you've probably already heard of or most likely tried yourself, but uh, uh, hopefully you'll take away something new from here. We're going to discuss things like how we improve the video decoder. So there's a, a new decoder you're going to be able to try out uh, in, in open source and available through PIP. We're also going to be talking about some of the experimental work we're doing in Torch data to enable some things like um, multi-threading uh, and uh, GPU pre-proc, uh, which the current data loader doesn't really support very well. So video data loading is pretty diverse. Uh, you could be doing something like uh, uh, generative AI, where you're trying to generate you know, very high resolution video. Uh, you need very high spatial resolutions, 4K, um, and very high temporal resolutions as well. Uh, or you might be doing something like content understanding, where you don't need, maybe the resolution doesn't need to be very high, the temporal resolution doesn't need to be very high, uh, but things like randomness uh, are extremely important for, say, an integrity use case. So what is it about video that makes it so difficult? Uh, well, the first is that video data sets are often really, really large. Uh, they could be multi-petabytes. Um, they're not going to fit on your host disk, and these are going to be in distributed storage. Uh, the next is that there can be a lot of variance in multiple dimensions with video data sets. So they can vary in length, uh, they can vary in resolution, and encoding formats. Um, you could do things like offline pre-proc in order to help with this, but that can also often be very expensive for large production scale data sets. Uh, and lastly, decoding videos is extremely compute intensive. So if you're using the host to decode, you will often hit CPU bottlenecks uh, in your training, um, or also very commonly CPU out of memories. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, an example data set here, uh, which is the Kinetics 400. And um, this is uh, an open source data set with about 240,000 training videos. So it's relatively small. Um, and uh, the, uh, the video lengths are usually around 10 seconds, so also pretty short. Uh, but it's a good example for us today because um, it's open source and it's something you can try out and also pretty relevant. Uh, we're going to be training a very simple model, just a linear classifier. Uh, we'll be doing distributed data parallel. Uh, and we're training on uh, 16 hosts, each having eight NVIDIA A100 GPUs, so 128 GPUs total. Um, and each host has 96 cores uh, to share among those eight GPUs uh, and 1.5 terabytes of memory. This is con and these are all configured in a training cluster with high-speed interconnects. And the metrics we're going to be going through, uh, we're going to be tracking today. Uh, so number one is throughput, which we'll measure as frames per second. We define that as uh, the number of totally, uh, total successfully decoded and transformed frames divided by the total training time. Uh, and for today's example, for each video, we sample eight frames per video uh, at uh, 224 by 224 resolution. Uh, we'll also be tracking a metric that we call coverage. So this is the percentage of successfully decoded videos. Uh, and to get slightly more granular, we're also going to be looking at uh, what we'll call data time today. Um, and if you can see my cursor on the screen. Yeah, uh, perfect. Um, so imagine we have these three ranks training uh, for one step. 
And rank one takes the longest time to fetch that next batch. So that's the maximum over all the different ranks. That's what we call the data time for this step. Um, so we'll be reporting the data time, which is the sum of all of these maximums across the entire training run. And then the last metric is uh, what we're calling today the model time. So this is uh, basically the full step time minus that data time, so whatever is left over. And uh, this is gonna include things like uh, transfers from host to device, uh, the model forward and the model backward pass. So for our baseline, um, it was, we have this little cartoon over here. Uh, our videos are stored in distributed blob storage, um, and we use the standard data loader to read a, bat, a local batch size of 32, which gives us 4,000 videos per batch. Um, and because we're sampling eight frames from there, that's uh, 32,000 frames per batch. We have 16 multi-process workers, so we're using the standard Torch Utils data loader in order to do multi-processing to parallelize uh, the data loading. Um, and that's what these little boxes are. Each process is gonna do its own work of reading blobs uh, from the cloud storage. We use the Torch Vision decoder to, trans uh, to extract the frames. Um, and then we do some light Torch Vision transforms, so things like cropping to 224, 224, maybe some random flips. Uh, Finally, we send that over the IPC queue to the main trainer process, and then the trainer does forward and backward. Uh, and we run for about 10 epics, but you know, we kind of had to change this depending on the, the speed, uh, the, the total training time. Um, right, and we're using the Torch Vision Decoder for our baseline. So how did we do here? Uh, we got about 6,000 frames per second. Uh, and the coverage, so we actually weren't able to successfully decode all of those. It's probably because of uh, some encoding format um, that wasn't compiled into the, the version of FFmpeg that we had. But uh, if you look at the data time and the model time, you can see that the training time was extremely dominated by loading data. So our GPUs were very, very hungry. Uh, in order to figure out the headroom for this particular model, so it's a very simple linear model, um, but uh, we just threw out all of the uh, online reading, and in the trainer process, we generate a random batch, transfer that to the device, send that over to the trainer, and you can see we get about a 40x improvement in the throughput. Um, and uh, from the data metrics and the model metrics, you can see that this is what we want. We don't want to be spending any time waiting for data. Uh, and now I'll let Abba talk about how we improve the decoder. Thank you, Andrew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emma, and I work on the Torch Codec video decoding library. As Andrew mentioned, video decoding is quite compute intensive. Let's dive in to understand what a video decoder actually does. So a video is a sequence of images that is highly compressed. And a decoder's job is to take a video and a timestamp from the user and extract out an RGB image at, that is displayed for that video at that timestamp and return it back as a PyTorch tensor. This process involves first seeking into the video at that timestamp, decompressing it because a video is highly compressed, then doing a color conversion process because videos typically have YUV format and we want RGB format out, and then converting that into a tensor. If you do any of these processes wrong, you can get correctness issues or you can get performance issues. When we saw the torch vision was slow, we tried to do, use a different video decoder, which is Decord, which is presented in this, in this slide. Decord is more efficient than torch vision at the seeking part, so it can seek more efficiently in the middle of the videos. So if you're sampling for frames in the middle of the videos, Decord is gonna be much faster. And that's what we were doing here. So Decord improves the performance over torch vision by about 4x, 4.8x as shown in this slide. And the coverage also goes up because it's using a different FFmpeg version. Speaking of seeking in the middle of the videos, there's an important gotcha here. Some of the video decoders that are out there, they don't implement seeking correctly. So they do in what is called inaccurate seeks. If you give it a video and a timestamp, it may return you a frame that is at a different timestamp, which will be not valuable to, to you as for your inference or training purposes. To demonstrate this, we generated a synthetic video, which is shown above, which is just a fractal video, and each of the frame is different. And we asked two different decoders to decode four different frames at four different timestamps in that video. 
Decoder A on the left side returned four different frames, which is what you would expect. But the Pi AV decoder, which is decoder B on the right side, gave you four copies, four copies of the same exact frame. So this, can, this, can, this is not what users expect, and it can lead to poor model performance. When we saw this unintuitive seeking behavior and performance issues with the existing decoders, we decided to create a new custom PyTorch video decoding library that we call Torch Codec. Torch Codec aims to be both accurate and fast. So it's accurate both in terms of seeking and accurate in terms of the actual bits that you get out of it in terms of color conversion. It is fast because it does seeking efficiently and it is fast at color conversion and tensor converting to tensors. We, we try to allocate the minimal amount of memory that is needed to, to do this process. Here's some more information about Torch Codec. It's an open source library available on GitHub and the release is available on PyPy. So on a Linux machine, you can just do pip install Torch Codec and it will, you can start working on it. It has APIs for video metadata extraction video to tensor based on time or frame index, and it has efficient batch decoding also. Torch Codec is still a young library, and we have planned work for doing GPU decoding, audio decoding, and better samplers. Here's an example of how to use Torch Codec. First, you must install FFmpeg because it has a separate license, and then you can install Torch Codec using pip and then in just a few lines of code, you can create a decoder object from a video file that you have on disk. The length of the decoder object will tell you how many frames it has, and you can decode frames by using the square brackets annotation, or you can decode a frame that is displayed at a particular timestamp by using the last function, which is get frame displayed at. Here are some micro benchmarks that show Torch Vision versus Torch Codec decode performance on a single machine. The chart on the left shows decode performance for decoding sequential frames. That is, if you want to decode frames that are adjacent to each other. The chart in the middle shows random access decoding. That is, seeking plus decoding. And the chart on the right shows decoding on a 4K video. By the way, the video on the, the first two charts is from the Hugging Face Lee Robot repository, which I highly recommend you check out. There are three takeaways from this slide. One, decode performance can depend highly on the encoding format and the parameters used, for example, resolution or H264 versus 265 and so on. Second, sequential decoding is much faster than random access decoding. As you can see, the chart on the left has higher numbers than the chart in the middle. And third, Torch Codec is faster than Torch Vision Decoder in almost all scenarios. Lastly, to test Torch Codec on a real world example, we come back to our example that uh, we come back to the workload that Andrew mentioned. We implemented, we added Torch Codec with the K400 benchmark. It has full bit accuracy with respect to FFmpeg and it is seven times faster than Torch Vision. Now I'm gonna hand it back to Andrew for the rest of the talk. Thanks, Abad. Um, so at this point, we're gonna pivot slightly. Um, so what you'll notice uh, from the previous work is that we we're pretty heavily CPU bottlenecked. Um, and the, you know, one of the things you could think about doing is, hey, if we're bottlenecked by the CPU, can we move that compute off of the host so that we're no longer bottlenecked? So that's what we did here. The approach we chose, uh, there's a number of different ways you could do this, but what we're gonna describe today is uh, doing the video decoding offline before you even start the training. Um, so this turns out to help quite a bit. Uh, so we've modified our little cartoon on the bottom. Uh, we have a bunch of hosts that will decode those videos. Um, and for this example, we decided to store them as PNG. Uh, there's, this isn't always possible. Like, it depends on your particular use case uh, for training. Like maybe you really want that randomness. Maybe you're training for multiple epics and like, or you really want that ability to experiment with the way you're changing the temporal sampling. Um, but there are a lot of use cases out there. For us, we often see this in large-scale offline inference where you, know, you really just want to crunch through these frames as fast as possible um, and you don't want that sampling to change. Um, 
So there's a lot packed into this slide. Something else that we did when we did that decoding is that we moved the storage away from the distributed cloud store and we put them onto disks that are co-located with the trainers. So this eliminates any possibilities of doing cross-region reads uh, and lowers the variance in pulling the, uh, the data to the machines, to the hosts. The last thing we did is that in instead of writing the images all point-wise, um, we kind of write them in batches so that uh, they're stored sequentially. This lets us take advantage of sequential batch reading um, on the training side as well. So with the results from this, we're able to see a 17x speed up over uh, our baseline now. So, uh, and at, I think this is the first time we see that we're spending less time loading data than we are uh, in the model, which is promising, but you know, the GPUs are still a little bit hungry. Something else interesting you might notice is that the model time has actually gone up, which is really unintuitive and, and a little bit perplexing. So we haven't changed anything about the, the simple linear model that we're doing. We're still copying hosted device. Why is this model time slower? So one of the things we suspected was that with multi-processing, um, you have to send the data from the worker processes over to the trainer process uh, over an IPC queue. And there's some CPU work that happens in the back end, uh, kind of invisibly, um, to help make that transfer more efficient so you're not doing a full, uh, so you're not having to do a full copy every time. Um, but, so uh, yeah, so in order to test this, we uh, basically uh, hacked into the code a little bit, and just before the batch hits the IPC queue, we send an empty dictionary over the queue instead, so we're basically not sending any data. And then on the trainer side, uh, we use the same dummy batch that we did for the headroom analysis. Um, and you can see that this actually brings the model time back down, uh, which is, um, you know, I think that's what we wanted to see, but also still a little bit surprising. This is obviously not a very useful approach to do, though. Uh, in production, you can't just feed dummy batches. That wouldn't really tell you anything interesting. Um, so the question is, how can we get rid of this IPC? Well, with multi-threading, you don't need to send things from one process to another. Uh, the work can be done. The batches can stay in the same process, so you eliminate that transfer entirely. Uh, but the current Torch Utils data loader does not yet support multi-threading. So this is something we've been thinking heavily about, um, especially with the no-gil work coming, uh, coming up um, in Python 3.13. Uh, uh, so we've been developing a prototype. Uh, we're planning to land some of these pieces in Torch data. We currently have an RFC out for this uh, in the PyTorch slash data repo, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, and what this looks like is a more granular way to do parallelism. So instead of having this one data set that you send to each process or one data set that gets parallelized through threads, uh, we actually are allowing you to do parallelism at the individual node level uh, of your data loading DAG. So um, in this case, uh, we're using multi-threaded parallelism in order to pull, uh, to pull data from the cloud, or in this case, the, the co-located storage. Uh, we pass that down a queue. And then we have another set of thread workers uh, in order to parallelize the PNG decoding. So this is still happening on the CPU. We're not doing video decoding anymore. Uh, this is PNG. And um, we're doing the online pre-proc. This is also on the CPU. So the cropping and the flipping. Um, and now we send that to the trainer process. Uh, and the big question is, we're running this experiment with the global interpreter lock. So we still have the GIL. This is not done with the no-gill yet. So is this actually going to work uh, in terms of improving our throughput? Uh, the answer is no, unfortunately. So uh, we moved away from that table, and we're now looking at some plots uh, because, uh, because uh, we found that increasing the batch size, uh, we did start to see some wins. So just to walk through this a little slowly, um, the yellow line here is the multi-threaded experimental code. With the blue line, that's the traditional multi-processing setup. Um, and on the x-axis, we're increasing the local batch size from 32, 64, uh, up to 512. So what you'll notice with this throughp throughput plot on the left is that by increasing the batch size, you'd expect to see batching efficiencies from the model forward backward, um, from the reading. Um, and you don't, you're not able to capture that with the multi-processing. However, with the multi-threading, 
you can get up, uh, you can start to see that throughput increase uh, as you increase the batch size. So again, this is something that's gonna be very use case dependent. You know, your model, you might not be able to run with batch sizes that large. Um, however, where we do see a lot of wins uh, for these cases are for offline inference where you maybe don't have a backward pass and you're able to handle these, uh, uh, you're able to uh, handle these larger batch sizes. The other thing which uh, is probably apparent here is that uh, with IP, uh, with multiprocessing, the memory requirements are a lot higher. So you're not able to get to those large batch sizes. You hit CPU ooms. Uh, whereas with multi-threading, it's a little more efficient. So you're able to scale to those larger batch sizes. Uh, with this plot on the right, um, we're just tracking the model time. Um, so same thing here. The yellow line, you can see that the model time is dropping with those batching efficiencies as we'd expect. So the last experiment that I'm gonna describe for you today uh, is where we thought, hey, why don't we try to use this batching um, and use this underutilized GPU to do some of the GPU pre-proc, so the cropping and the flips. Um, why don't we do those on the GPU instead? So what we did is that we made another cut in our graph here and in a single background thread, so we're not using parallelism uh, for this GPU pre-proc, we're sending the device, uh, we're sending the batch to the GPU um, and then we just run our torch vision transforms as normal. So now all of these pre-proc uh, operations are gonna happen uh, on the GPU. Uh, and yeah, so the results that you see, we're gonna have a new plot, a new line here on the plot with this, uh, marked with this little X. Um, so we're able to get the highest throughput we've seen so far, uh, the end-to-end -end throughput for this particular model. Um, and you'll notice that the model time has dropped as well since we no longer need to copy that batch over to the uh, device anymore. It's already there and actually as part of the, uh, the pre-proc time. Right, so we have, I think, a few minutes left. Uh, I'll just summarize the discuss techniques. Uh, so we started with this baseline with the Torch Vision Decoder. Um, by switching to Torch Codec, which I think you can do today, uh, you should get a 7x uh, throughput increase. Um, if you're able to do offline decoding, you can afford the storage. Um, you can move over everything over uh, to, uh, before you start the training, do a lot of that CPU heavy work, um, and you can get even more increases here. Uh, by moving to multi-threading, we can see improved throughput at larger batch sizes, so this may or may not work for your particular scenario. And finally, with GPU pre-proc, we're able to see even more. There's a bunch of stuff we haven't tried. So um, if you've seen NVIDIA's poster, uh, hopefully you got to talk to them last night, but uh, the, uh, the work with the no-gill, so getting rid of that global interpreter lock to really unlock multi-threading in Python is something we're extremely excited about and one of the reasons we're prioritizing this effort on Torch data. So that's something we're planning to do some benchmarks and experiments and hopefully share to you later this year. Um, some of the other things, uh, chatting with NVIDIA, uh, there's a couple of things we could do uh, to explore, such as using the GPU de to decode the images. So in this uh, presentation, we used PNGs, which turned out to be not a great example. If we had stored them as JPEGs, it turns out you can use uh, the A100s to decode those JPEGs as well. So that's a lesson learned. Um, similarly for video decoding. So a lot of GPU, GPUs have uh, dedicated video decoding chips, so this is something we're also exploring on the Torch Codex side. So if you want to stay in an online world, uh, without paying for that storage or giving up that flexibility of sampling, um, but your GPUs are just sitting there idle, uh, this is possibly an option for you as well. So we're planning to do more experiments on this. Uh, look out for some blog posts from us uh, coming up. Uh, so just a couple of takeaways before we wrap up. Um, I think number one, I was blown away when I saw Ahmad's uh, uh, screenshots of like, hey, I think I'm sampling four frames and they're different, but actually they're all identical, which is, um, I don't know, it's probably not what you want to be doing. Uh, the next one is that, you know, run end-to-end -end benchmarks. I know you can't always do that. Uh, it's not that affordable, but uh, I think from some of the micro benchmarks we've seen today, uh, you can tell that it's not, it's not always, uh, it, the straight line benchmarks, the straight line decoding doesn't always translate into online distributed training. So you can see some weird things happen there. So this is important to do. Um, the other thing to call out here is that 
make sure that you're actually bottlenecked before you start trying to optimize stuff. Because a lot of times, especially in some of the generative work we're seeing, that forward and backward pass can take so long that it eats up any of that data time. So it's, if you're not bottlenecked, then like, you know, don't try to, pre, uh, to optimize too early. Um, the third point here is if you can, move that compute off of the box because that's, um, uh, because yeah, you can see some particular, you can see a ton of gains that way by, uh, to remove your CPU bottlenecks. Um, and lastly, uh, check out Torch Codec. Uh, you can get improved accuracy and performance, um, hopefully for free. Uh, yeah, so this is where you can find us. Uh, we're at github.com uh, slash PyTorch Torch Codec for the Torch Codec project. Um, and we're at PyTorch slash data for the Torch Data project. Uh, so if you're interested in contributing to the future of data loading in Torch Data and PyTorch, uh, come check out this RFC on what we're building. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter, GitHub, and we're available on the PyTorch Slack as well. <laughs>